Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank to Alessandro for a nice introduction, for inviting me. It's my great pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, the topic of my talk is tick-borne encephalitis from pathogenesis to novel antiviral strategies. Well, what are ticks? Aristotle, in his Historia Animalium, described ticks as disgusting parasitic animals. Uh, ticks are not only disgusting animals. Ticks are also important vectors or transmitters of infectious diseases. In Europe, it's mainly Lyme disease and tick-borne encephalitis virus. Uh, tick-borne encephalitis virus is a member of uh, family Flaviviridae, genus uh, Flavivirus. This group of um, viruses includes uh, several important human pathogens like uh, uh, Japanese encephalitis, West Nile, uh, dengue, or Zika virus. Um, Tick-borne encephalitis virus belongs to the most important human pathogens. Uh, Tick-borne encephalitis was firstly described in 1931 by Austrian physician uh, Schneider, who reported a seasonal disease, encephalitic disease, which he called Epidemische Acute Meningitis Serosa. Uh, the virus was isolated firstly in 1937 in Russia. Uh, in that year, the Soviet uh, Ministry of Health organized a series of uh, scientific, uh, scientific expeditions to the Russian Far East. It was after the Russian war uh, when the people came to Taiga and started to build new villages and towns. But a lot of uh, people there uh, became ill with a new disease. So the ministry uh, decided to send some scientists there to investigate uh, the origin of this disease and uh, the way of transmission. Uh, the work during this expedition was not easy as documented here in this report. Um, there is written that uh, uh, during the field work the scientists had to uh, stop frequently because uh, they had to uh, remove ticks from themselves. After one or two kilometers of walking in Taiga, each person was carrying more than 100 ticks on them. So, uh, you can imagine that uh, the work was quite difficult and it's not surprising that uh, several members of uh, the expedition also became ill with uh, this disease. Uh, some of them had a very severe course of the disease, some of them even died, uh, others uh, became deaf or were paralyzed. For example, Mikhail Chumakov, uh, one of the most important virologists of the last century also was infected with tick-borne encephalitis virus. He got paresis and uh, had uh, uh, hearing defects. But the expedition was successful. A new virus was isolated uh, from patients, rodents and ticks. The virus was called in that time Russian Spring Summer Encephalitis Virus. In Europe, the virus was firstly isolated in 1948 in Czechoslovakia by uh, Krejčí, Galia and Rampas. Dr. Galia also was infected with tick-borne encephalitis virus. He had quite severe course of the infection and he died in the age of uh, 38 years. Uh, from that time, we have also the first uh, descriptions of uh, clinical cases of tick-borne encephalitis. For example, in 1949, uh, it was reported uh, some case when patient uh, uh, with tick-borne encephalitis was attacking other patients. He forced another patient to eat breakfast. He claimed that he will kill him. Uh, sometimes his behavior was really curious. Uh, the patient has had uh, hallucinations. He saw white mice and uh, he was constantly screaming that Jesus Christ was the first socialist. Um, now we know that tick-borne encephalitis virus occurs in many European countries, mostly in Central and Eastern Europe, but also in Northern Asia, in uh, Russian Federation, in Northern China, uh, Northern Japan, uh, and we have also some recent reports from Korea. Uh, there are 
three subtypes of this virus. Actually, we already know that there are five subtypes, but uh, three subtypes are recognized by uh, the International Committee for Taxonomy of Viruses, uh, European, Siberian, and uh, Far Eastern subtype. Uh, members of these uh, subtypes uh, uh, differ in their biological properties. For example, uh, strains from the European subtype usually cause uh, mild disease with mortality up to 1%. Uh, Siberian subtype, this is a little bit more severe infection uh, and there are several cases which are uh, chronic. And the Far Eastern subtype causes the most severe infection with uh, mortality up to 20%. Uh, Tick-borne encephalitis virus is a positive stranded uh, RNA virus. Uh, the nucleocapsid uh, consists of uh, the viral RNA and and the capsid protein C. The nucleocapsid is surrounded uh, with a lipid bilayer and uh, there are two other proteins integrated uh, in, in the bilayer, the membrane protein and uh, E protein, envelope protein, which is the main viral antigen. Um, the disease has uh, biphasic curves in most patients. Uh, there is incubation period of about one week then uh, the first stage of the disease appears. The first stage is characterized with non-specific clinical symptoms like uh, fever, uh, nausea, um, anorexia, uh, like flu. Uh, then there's about one week gap, symptom free period. And uh, in about 30% uh, of patients, there's the second stage of the infection, which is characterized with uh, neurological uh, symptoms. Uh, this stage can be manifested by, uh, as uh, uh, meningitis, encephalitis, encephalomyelitis. Uh, the encephalitis and encephalomyelitis uh, represents, uh, represent the more severe forms. And the percentage of the more severe forms increases with the age of the patients. As I already mentioned, uh, in case of uh, members uh, of the European subtype, the mortality is quite low, it's below 1%, but the main problem are permanent problems after tick-borne encephalitis. Uh, here are some data from our local hospital. In about 25% of patients, we observed so-called post-encephalitic syndrome. This means these patients uh, have permanent headache, uh, tremor, sleeping disorders, vertigo, uh, concentration problems. Some of the patients uh, have uh, um, psychological or mental uh, problems. So tick-borne encephalitis is, uh, is really a severe disease. In most cases, uh, the virus enters the host body during tick feeding. Uh, the virus is present in tick saliva, and the saliva also contain a lot of uh, pharmacologically active compounds which uh, uh, modulate the microenvironment in the site of feeding. Uh, the virus replicates in the skin or subcutaneous tissues, then dendritic cells, or Langerhans, uh, Langerhans cells, uh, transmit the virus from the skin to the local lymph nodes. The virus replicates there in macrophages and is released into the bloodstream. This is called primary viremia. Uh, during the primary viremia, the virus infects uh, different organs and tissues in the body, uh, muscles, uh, uh, liver, spleen, uh, also bone marrow. It replicates there and is released again to the bloodstream in higher titer. This is called secondary viremia. And uh, during the secondary viremia, the virus crosses the blood-brain barrier and uh, enters the brain as uh, its target organ. Uh, today, I am going to talk about the role of the blood-brain barrier during the tick-borne encephalitis, about the interaction of the virus with uh, cells in the central nervous system, and about some possible thera therapeutic approaches. So let's start with the blood-brain barrier. 
Uh, in our initial experiments, we infected two strains of mice, bulb C and C57 uh, uh, black 6 mice with tick-borne encephalitis virus. Uh, we measured uh, changes in uh, body temperature, body wave in these mice. We observed that starting on day 10 or 11, there was a rapid decrease of uh, body temperature and body wave in these mice, which correlated quite well with the mortality curves. Uh, peak of viremia, the secondary viremia, was on day 4, and then the virus was present in the brain starting from day 5, and the titer in the brain was uh, increasing. Uh, regarding the blood-brain barrier, we did some similar experiments as uh, did Paul Ehrlich more than 100 years ago. Uh, Paul Ehrlich injected some aniline dyes uh, into brains of rodents and also intraperitoneally. If he injected the dye into the brain, he observed that the brain is stained. If he injected the dye intraperitoneally, he observed that almost the whole body of, of the mouse is stained, with the exception of the brain. On this basis, he postulated that there must be some barrier between the central nervous system and the rest of the body. This barrier was later called uh, blood-brain barrier. Uh, in our experiments, we did not inject uh, aniline dyes, but we injected uh, fluorescent. Uh, sodium fluorescine, which is a compound which uh, is normally excluded from the uh, brain. From day 0 to day 9, we didn't observe any accumulation of fluorescine in the brain tissue. But starting on day 10, there were some foci of increased fluorescence, and on day 11, almost the whole brain uh, had a strong fluorescent signal. Uh, we did homogenates uh, from these brains and confirmed uh, this also using fluorimeters. So this means on day 10 there was rapid increase uh, of the level of fluorescence in the brain tissue. This means that uh, during uh, tick-borne encephalitis this, there's a strong breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. But this breakdown is not necessary for virus entry into the brain because we already observed the virus in the brain on day 5, 6 or 7, but the breakdown occurred on day 10. Uh, we measured uh, uh, the migration of immunocompetent cells into the brain and we also, also measured the expression of several cytokines and chemokines in the brain. Uh, we observed that the kinetics of these expressions uh, quite well correlates with uh, the kinetics of the breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. And uh, this also correlates with the migration of mostly uh, CD8 plus T cells into the brain. So we hypothesized that the breakdown can be caused by the CD8 plus T cells. So we did uh, a next experiment uh, with uh, a knockout in a CD8 gene. Uh, also in these mice, however, we observed that there's a strong breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. There's, there's also no uh, migration of immunocompetent cells into the brain, but there's strong expression of cytokines and chemokines. So it seems that uh, the breakdown of the blood-brain barrier is independent on the migration of immunocompetent cells to the brain, but uh, represents more, more probably a bystander effect of the cytokine and chemokine overproduction in the brain tissue. In the next experiments, we did some in vitro experiments using uh, primary human microvascular brain cells, cells that uh, form the blood-brain barrier. Uh, we observed that at least some of these cells are sensitive uh, to the infection, uh, but we never saw more than 2% positive cells in the culture. So on only some cells are sensitive. But even of this low percentage of uh, sensitive cells, these cells produce very high virus titers. Uh, 
next, we did the experiments with uh, in vitro blood-brain barrier model. This model is based on co-culture of these endothelial cells with uh, glial cells or astrocytes in a transfer system. Uh, here in this model, uh, this chamber represents the blood and the bigger chamber represents the brain. Uh, we put virus into the upper chamber. We observed that uh, during two or six hours, the virus was present only there. Uh, it infected uh, the cells, but starting from 24 hours, the virus appeared also in the lower compartment. This means uh, the few cells were infected with the virus, but these cells uh, transported or transmitted uh, the virus from the upper compartment to the lower compartment. This means uh, these cells can transport the virus from the periphery, from the blood, to the brain. We measured transendothelial electrical resistance between these two compartments to see if the infection of these cells has any effect on the integrity of uh, the uh, cell monolayer or the integrity of the barrier. And we didn't see any differences uh, versus uh, uninfected cells. Um, so uh, this means the cells are sensitive to the infection, they produce the virus, but it has no effect on the integrity of the barrier. This was also confirmed in this experiment when we put some fluorescent dyes in, uh, to the upper compartment uh, and we didn't see any differences between the infected cells and the mock cells in terms of uh, the migration of the dye to the lower compartment. So, uh, yeah, this all means that the cells are sensitive, can transfer the virus, but this has no effect on the integrity of the barrier. Um, the endothelial cells, together with astrocytes and uh, neurons, form so-called uh, neurovascular unit. The endothelial cells uh, forming the blood-brain barrier are connected with tight junction proteins like occludin, claudin, or uh, zonula occludens. So we did also some staining of these proteins and we observed that also uh, in, in the infected cells there's no effect on the expression of these uh, tight junction proteins. We did also correlative microscopy, that's, that's a new technique which allows uh, to do uh, correlative um, observations uh, from fluorescence microscopy and from scanning electron microscopy. As you can see, this is uh, the staining for zonula occludens. There is no effect on the uh, expression of, of this protein in the infected cells uh, as documented from the fluorescence as well as uh, from the scanning electron microscopy. There are tight connections between the cells. This is occluding uh, pretty the same results. Uh, we didn't see any differences in terms of expression of uh, zonula occludin or claudin uh, or yeah, occludin uh, uh, in these uh, infected cultures, but we did see some uh, down regulation of expression of adhesive molecules. And now we are working on some Western blots. Uh, this is quite new results. Uh, we need to verify that by Western blots. So taken together, this means that during tick-borne encephalitis, there's strong breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. But this break breakdown is mediated by the cytokines and chemokines produced in the infected brain. The cells forming the blood-brain barrier, at least some of them, are sensitive to the infection and can transmit the infection from the blood to the brain. But the infection itself has no effect on the integrity of the barrier. And what happens directly in the brain? In the next experiments, we infected uh, primary human neurons with tick-borne encephalitis virus. Again, we observed that uh, these uh, neurons produce very high virus titers. At uh, the early time points, we observed that uh, almost the whole uh, body of, of the neuron uh, 
uh, expresses uh, the, the bioantigen, the bio e protein. Uh, we did see uh, the uh, fluorescence uh, uh, in the body of, of the neuron, but also there were some fluorescence signal in the dendrites. Uh, the infection was associated with uh, dramatic uh, morphological uh, changes in the infected neurons. Here's one example from electron tomography. Here's a proliferation and reorganization of endoplasmic reticule. Uh, at later time points, it means like on day 10 or 12, we did see uh, accumulation of the viral antigen in such uh, concentric uh, structures closely connected uh, to cell nucleus. Um, I will skip this little slide. Uh, using tomogra electron tomography, we observed that uh, these concentric uh, structures represent uh, such, uh, such holes of the adenoplasmic reticulum. This is a stress response of the neurons to the infection. Uh, this is quite a frequent event, but we never saw anything like that in the control uh, neurons. Uh, we saw bioparticles in the endoplasmic reticulum, but we also observed uh, such strange tubule-like structures present in, uh, in the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, these structures are also seen in this uh, uh, movie. Uh, here are two types of these uh, tubular-like structures, uh, structures of two different diameters. Uh, we never saw anything like that in, uh, in the control cells, so it means these structures are related to the, to the infection. Uh, we don't know exactly the function of these struc structures, but we have some preliminary data that uh, these structures are formed uh, by the viral envelope protein. Uh, but we are working on, on that, on that uh, function of, of these structures. Uh, we did see also um, signs of autophagy <coughs> in the infected neurons. Here's uh, an autophagophore. Uh, this has the hole, uh, and uh, here's uh, an autophagosomes. In the autophagosomes, we observed viral particles, but there were also lipid droplets. Um, autophagy is an innate defense mechanism, uh, which uh, is used mostly by neural cells, but also other cell types uh, use uh, this mechanism. Uh, this process uh, serves for elimination of uh, damaged organelles, for example, or also uh, for removal of the, the infection from the cell. Uh, here's the phagophore with the hole, which encloses the things which, which should be uh, destroyed. Uh, here's the autophagosome, which uh, fuses with uh, lysosomes, forming autophagolysosome. And from the autophagolysosome, uh, there are amino acids, uh, fatty acids, sugars, nucleosides, restored and uh, put back uh, to the cell. Uh, there is evidence that uh, in case of some viral infections, this is a protective um, mechanism. But uh, in some viral diseases, the autophagy is used by the virus uh, for their, their own. Uh, some viruses exploit this mechanism to produce fatty acid, acids uh, for their host cell to keep them metabolically active for a longer time and produce higher vir virus titers. So we tested what's the role of autophagy in tick-borne encephalitis in the neurons. We infected human neuroblastoma cells with the virus, and we treated the cells with rapamycin, which is inductor of autophagy, and spoutin-1, which is inhibitor of autophagy. And we observed that in, in case of uh, induction of autophagy, there's a dose-dependent increase of the viral titer. On the other hand, if we treated the cells with spouting one, there was those dependent decrease of the virus titer. So this means that in case of tick-borne encephalitis, the autophagy is used for the virus 
replication for keeping the cells alive and producing higher virus titers. We also observed the viral particles enclosed in vesicles in close contact in, uh, to cellular uh, microtubules. Um, uh, these microtubules can represent something like a highway for uh, virus movement uh, inside the neuron. Uh, in this way, the, the viruses can be also transmitted from one infected neuron to another one without the need to be uh, spread uh, to the extracellular space. Uh, we also treated uh, neuroblastoma cells with nocodazole, which is a disruptor of uh, microtubules, and we observed a uh, significant decrease of the virus titer, so the, the microtubules are necessary for efficient virus production. Okay, that were experiments with neurons. And what happens in astrocytes? Uh, neurons are the main target for, for the virus in the brain, but under some conditions also astrocytes can be infected. Uh, so we did experiments with primary human astrocytes in culture. We observed uh, that some astrocytes in the culture are sensitive to the infection. We never saw more than 20% of cells uh, infected by the virus, but these cells again produced, uh, produced the high virus titers. Uh, the infection of astrocytes was also uh, associated with quite severe morphological changes. Uh, here's a control cell, here's an infected cell, uh, here you can see disruption of mitochondria, mitochondria uh, disruption of Golgi, uh, proliferation of endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, we also observed the tubule-like structures present in uh, the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, here are electron tomographic reconstructions and uh, uh, pictures from the electron microscopy. And we also observed the viral particles or virus-induced vesicles directly attached to these uh, tubule-like structures. Uh, we observed that the infection causes quite strong activation of uh, the astrocytes as uh, uh, documented by measurement of uh, expression of GFAPM marker of astrocytes, uh, astrocyte uh, activation. And this activation by the infection was even stronger uh, than uh, treatment with LPS. There are data from flow cytometry and uh, figure from immunofluorescence, which also appeared on the cover of uh, JGV. Uh, the activation of astrocytes uh, was associated with a strong uh, production of uh, cytokines, chemokines, uh, in particular IP10 and BIP1 beta, and also matrix metalloproteinase 9. Uh, this, uh, this compound uh, or this molecule is known to cause uh, the breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. Uh, we did also some studies in tick-borne encephalitis patients in their serum and we observed that these patients uh, indeed have uh, higher levels of MMP9 and also the ratio of MMP9 and uh, its tissue inhibitor, TIMP1, is significantly higher in the group of uh, patients. So it, uh, it's, it indicates that uh, in the patients there's higher expression of MMP9 and uh, the MMP9 is probably produced by the activated astrocytes in the brain. So to sum up this first part, uh, there's a blood-brain barrier breakdown occurring during tick-borne encephalitis at later stages of the infection. This breakdown is not necessary for the virus entry into the brain. The breakdown is mediated by cytokines, but not but, uh, by uh, CD8 plus T cells migrating to the brain. Uh, neurons are primary targets for tick-borne encephalitis virus in the brain. Neurons activate uh, uh, innate defense mechanisms like autophagy, but the virus uses the autophagy for its own replication. Uh, we previously demonstrated that there is immunopathology during tick-borne encephalitis mediated by CD8 plus T cells. 
Also, some astrocytes are sensitive to TBEV. Uh, Activation leads to high production of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, chemokines, and also MMP9. And the cytokines and, and MMP9 uh, produced by astrocytes can cause the breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. Okay, these are data from uh, the basic studies on pathogenesis, but uh, we want to do also something for the patients. Um, Previously, uh, tick-borne encephalitis was quite effectively treated with monoclonal antibodies. But uh, this therapy was stopped uh, because of concerns of antibody-dependent enhancement. Uh, the only thing which is uh, clinically approved uh, for the use also in tick-borne encephalitis is the use of high-dose high intravenous immunoglobulins, IVIC. Uh, the, the effects of IVIC can be in a neutralization of the pathogen, but also IVIC has uh, immunomodulatory properties uh, like blocking FC receptors of macrophages, uh, blocking the complement activation, blocking some uh, cytokines and uh, chemokines. Uh, we bought two lots of IVIC from the same uh, producer. And we firstly check uh, the levels of uh, specific antibodies present uh, in, these, uh, in these preparations, uh, specific antibodies against tick-borne encephalitis. We observed that uh, in one lock there were quite high titers of uh, the specific antibodies. Uh, in the second lot there was practically nothing. This, these are data from ELISA, these are data from uh, neutralization test. Uh, yeah, the IVIC-2 had a high level of neutralization antibodies, IVIC-1 had nothing. We did uh, some experiments with human uh, neuroblastoma and glioblastoma cells treated with uh, these two lots of IVIC. In case of IVIC-1, there was almost no neutralization of the virus, no effect on the virus growth uh, in the culture. In case of IVIC-2, there was a strong neutralization. We did also experiments in mice. In case of IVIC-1, there was no effect on the infection. In case of IVIC-2, there was a high level of protection reaching uh, 90%. So this means that uh, uh, IVIC, which contains the specific uh, antibodies against tick-borne encephalitis, is active has a protective role, but IVIC, which doesn't have the specific an antibodies, do doesn't have any effect. There's no immunomodulatory function, so it doesn't work. Uh, we were next interested on the interaction of the antibodies with the cellular particle. Uh, we did some cryo-electron microscopy of the particles and also of the particles uh, with attached uh, monoclonal antibodies. First of all, we needed to produce very high virus titers for the cryo-electron microscopy, which was quite challenging. Uh, we did cultures of the virus, uh, we did uh, purification of the virus, and we finally got uh, samples with uh, high virus titer, uh, 10 to the 12 or even 10 to the 13 for uh, uh, cryo-electron microscopy and uh, these reconstructions. Uh, this is immunotherapy, but we were also interested in uh, therapy based on uh, molecules that directly um, interfere with the virus replication in the host cell. Uh, firstly, we tested uh, a group of uh, molecule or nucleoside analogs uh, for their, their effect against tick-borne encephalitis virus and we were lucky enough to identify some with a very nice uh, antiviral effect. Here's a picture from uh, the culture without inhibitor. You can see very strong uh, cytopathic effect in case of the presence of the inhibitor. There's a nice monolayer, no cytopathic effect is present. Uh, some of these inhibitors like 2' uh, C-methyladenosine, uh, 7 deaza 2' C-methyladenosine and 2' uh, C methylcytidine. Uh, these compounds reduced the virus titer for 
let's say, six or seven locks, and D means nothing was detected, uh, the titer was below the detection limit, so the effect was really nice. Uh, these compounds also blocked uh, completely uh, antigen uh, production in these cells. Uh, we did also cytotoxicity tests. Uh, we observed that uh, in case of CMA, there was some, some tiny, some small cytotoxicity at uh, the concentration of uh, 50 micromolars. In case of CMC, there was some cytotoxicity increasing with the dose, but in case of 7 deaza to prime CMA, there was no cytotoxicity up to 50 micromolar concentration. Um, we also determined uh, the um, EC50s. Uh, these were quite low for uh, the 7 deaza to prime C methyl adenosine. Was th that was the most effective compound. That was 5.1 uh, micromolar. We did some in silico docking of these molecules to the active site of uh, NS5, the viral uh, polymerase. We observed that all three compounds, compounds uh, uh, move quite specifically to the active uh, sound, uh, site. Uh, the most specific interaction was seen in case of the most effective compound. Next to this, we extended uh, the group of tested molecules to a whole bunch of other nucleoside analogs, and we observed that uh, next uh, to the previously <coughs> described uh, compounds, there are some other also active. Yeah, this is a toxicity test. Uh, test. Uh, we saw that uh, some of them were toxic, but the other had quite uh, no effect. Uh, yeah. Here are the previously described molecules, here are the toxic molecules, and there are also some, mm, yeah, uh, uh, these are the first three, and here uh, are some compounds, other uh, active against the virus, I will skip this, uh, which allowed uh, some stru structure based study of the compounds active against tick-borne encephalitis virus. We observed that compounds which uh, are methylated in a two prime C position, uh, these are active, and uh, also compounds which uh, uh, have uh, azido group in four prime uh, position. Uh, we did also some experiments uh, uh, on the kin kinetics uh, of these compounds uh, in the cells uh, by a mass spectrometry. We observe that peak of the presence of these compounds is usually on uh, two hours uh, post exposure. Then uh, the concentration goes, uh, concentrations go down. Um, yeah. We did also some experiments in mice and we observed that uh, uh, mice that were infected with tick-borne encephalitis virus and treated with the 7 deaza analog. Um, this analog uh, significantly reduced clinical signs of, of uh, the disease, uh, reduced the mortality of these mice, uh, delayed uh, the onset of these signs and also decreased the viral titers in the brain. Uh, we did also some live imaging uh, in uh, reporter mice for interferon beta uh, to see uh, the effect of these compounds if in real time. Uh, these are control mice. Uh, these are mice that were infected with the virus and treated. And uh, here are mice that were infected and mock treated. Uh, and you can see quite nice differences in these mice. The virus is present in the brain already on day four. Uh, these mice uh, have only traces of the infection um, in the body. Uh, we did also some subcultures of the virus in the presence of uh, the drug uh, to see if there is some emergence of drug-resistant mutants. Uh, after several subcultures, we did a cytopathic effect uh, in these cells, and uh, yeah, finally we isolated a mutant virus which was resistant uh, to the compound. In the cell culture, uh, this mutant virus produced much smaller uh, plaques uh, in comparison with the 
valve type. This mutant was resistant to all these uh, methylated molecules, but uh, was uh, sensitive uh, to the azido uh, uh, modified uh, nucleosides. Uh, we did uh, comparative studies of infectivity of uh, the valve type and the mutant strain uh, in uh, mice, and we observed that the mutant strain is resistant to the infection but is attenuated uh, in mice. Uh, we did whole genome sequencing of these uh, two viruses, and we observed that the resistance is associated with a mutation in the active site of NS5. Uh, uh, protein uh, in the active site of uh, the viral uh, polymerase. The mutation is from serine through treonin. This is very small change. Uh, usually it's believed that uh, such uh, substitution has no effect on the biological properties, but in this case it had a quite a dramatic effect. Uh, as you saw, the virus produced smaller pl plaques, the virus was attenuated. Uh, here are so, some in silico analysis. Uh, this change uh, just produced one rotamer here in this uh, active site, which made uh, a bigger space in, in the active site of, of the polymerase, allowing the removal of the incorrect nucleoside from the active site. Yeah, also the docking experiments, uh, the green dots represent the docking uh, in the valve type, the red spots represent the mutant. And uh, as you can see, with the exception of CMA, uh, in case of CMC and uh, the Deaza analog, uh, these uh, compounds in the mutant uh, strain were rapidly removed from the active sign, uh, site and bind uh, non-specifically to, to ad other uh, positions. So to sum up the second part of my talk, uh, we did some experiments with high-dose intravenous immunoglobulin. Uh, we observed that there is no immunomodulatory therapeutic effect seen in uh, preparations which uh, do not contain uh, sufficient levels of uh, the specific antibodies. Uh, but uh, preparations which contained the specific antibodies effectively neutralized the virus both in vivo and in vitro. Uh, <coughs> we investigated the mechanism of uh, tick-borne encephalitis virus neutralization by antibodies using the cryo-electron tomography. Uh, we observed that uh, the neutralizing antibodies block the structural changes of the E protein at low pH. Uh, we identified 2'-C-methyladenosine as a strong uh, inhibitor of tick-borne encephalitis virus, but uh, there was some cytotoxicity of this compound. The 7 deaza 2 prime c methyladenosine was a very strong inhibitor of tick-borne encephalitis virus. There was no cytotoxicity, there was no degradation of cellular metabolism, and there was also a strong activity seen in uh, vivo in the infected mice. We did uh, structural activity relationships of the nucleoside analogs for inhibition of uh, tick-borne encephalitis virus, and we observed that the nucleoside analogs which uh, have uh, the methyl uh, group in the C2 position or the azido modification in uh, C4 prime position are active. Um, yeah, I already mentioned that this compound is active also in vivo. Uh, we generated the resistant mutants. Uh, this resistance uh, was uh, caused by a mutation in the active site of uh, uh, NS5, uh, the viral polymerase. Uh, this mutant was resistant to all 2 prime C methylated antivirus. Um, yeah, we also observed, I forgot to mention, that the uh, resistant re resistance phenotype was not stable after one or two subcultures uh, of this mutant virus without the presence of the compound. There was quite uh, fast uh, uh, mutation back uh, to the wild type uh, phenotype. And uh, our collaborator in Japan also did uh, some experiments with infectious uh, uh, cDNA clone. He introduced uh, this mutation. The virus was sensitive 
uh, was resistant to the antiviral, but uh, when he subcultured this mutant without the presence of, uh, of the antiviral, uh, the mutation appeared back very rapidly. So I would like to thank to the collaborators, uh, Radim Nenska from the Institute of Organic Chemistry and Biochemistry, who provides uh, the molecules for antiviral testing, uh, Marketa Vaculovičová, René Kizek from Mendel University in Brno, who did the experiments with uh, live imaging of the mice infected. Kentaro Yoshi from Hokkaido University did the experiments with the infectious cDNA clone. Uh, we collaborate uh, with Eric de Klerk from Leven um, on the experiments with antivirus. Pavel Plevka did the structural studies. Uh, Victor Gill from Barcelona did the in silico uh, experiments and uh, my colleagues from the Biological Center uh, did uh, the electron tomography experiments. And this is our team. Most of the experiments that were presented today were done by my PhD student Martin Paulus and uh, my postdoc Luděk Ayer. And I thank you for your attention. <laughs>